This outer in the first place acts only as an organ in making the inner visible, or in general, a being for another. For the inner, insofar as it is in the organ, is the activity itself. The speaking mouth, the working hand, and if you like, the leg too, are the organs of performance and actualization, which have within them the action qua action, or the inner as such. But the externality which the inner obtains through them is the action as a reality separated from the individual. Speech and work are outer expressions in which the individual no longer keeps and possesses himself within himself, but lets the inner get completely outside of him, leaving it to the mercy of something other than himself. For that reason, we can say with equal truth that these expressions express the inner too much, as that they do so too little. Too much, because the inner itself breaks out in them, and there remains no antithesis between them and it. They give not merely an expression of the inner, but directly the inner itself. Too little, because in speech and action the inner turns itself into something else, thus putting itself at the mercy of the element of change, which twists the spoken word and the accomplished act into meaning something else than they are in and for themselves as actions of this particular individual. Not only do the results of the actions through this externality of the influences of others lose the character of being something constant in face of other individualities, but since in their relationship to the inner which they contain, they behave as a separated, indifferent externality, they can, qua inner, through the individual himself, be something other than they appear to be. Either the individual intentionally makes them appear to be other than what they are in truth, or else he is too clumsy to give himself the outer aspect he really wanted and to establish it so firmly that his work cannot be misconstrued by others. The action, then, as a completed work, has the double and opposite meaning of being either the inner individuality and not its, its, its expression, or, qua external, a reality free from the inner, a reality which is something quite different from the inner. On account of this ambiguity, we must look around, for the inner, as it still is within the individual himself, but in a visible or external shape. In the organ, however, it is present only as the immediate actu activity itself, which attains its externalization in the deed, which either does or again does not represent the inner. The organ regarded in the light of this antithesis does not therefore provide the expression which is sought. Here in paragraph 312, I think that you're going to now see some of the central themes and, and get a sense for the, you might call it the flavor of this entire section of, of the work, or at least the first part of the section. Because we're talking in terms now not just of individualities and laws and bodies, or even in terms of the inner and the outer, but in terms of what we might call concrete actualizations, things that we can, we can relate to quite well. That's one of the th things that I really like about this section as opposed to some of the others, that um, w you know, it often feels when we're reading Hegel as if we're groping around a bit trying to figure, well, what, what does the negativity mean in this case? Here we're actually talking about stuff that's very easy for us to place. Um, oftentimes experiences that we ourselves have had and, and can, can uh, easily recall. Um, he's going to be talking about hands and mouths, actions, speech, and about the slippage that occurs between those and what it is that they're supposed to be expressing. So he begins by talking about the outer, the outer from the last paragraph, as you know, something that's supposed to express the inner, but it acts as an organ, he says, or if you like, a, a tool, right? An instrumentality for making the inner visible. And Hegel's going to talk quite a lot about the visible and the invisible in paragraphs yet to come, sometimes in paradoxical ways, talking about a visible invisible or, or things along those lines. So just you know, be attentive to that. He says, in general, a being for another, right? It makes the inner of the, the, the individual, the human person, visible for another, 
not just for themselves. This is not a solipsism uh, with the individual individuality standing in front of a mirror. This is uh, an individuality existing within a world of other human beings, and we're going to see this this come to the fore. So he says the inner, insofar as it is in the organ is the activity itself. So we have the inner as activity. The inner can be in the organ, visible within it, right? And this leads to an externalization, not just an expression, but an externalization. He goes on and he says, um, the speaking mouth, the working hand, and if you like, the legs too, are the organs of performance and actualization, which have within them the action, qua action. What does it mean to be an action? We started exploring this earlier in the first section of Observing Reason, and, and to a lesser extent in the self-consciousness section. Now we're actually grappling with this. What does it mean to be action as Action. Well, it means to be externalized. And this leads to a sort of, um, you could call it a paradox if you like, namely that the action of the person whose action it is ceases to be their action alone. Um, this is something, by the way, that, that another great dialectical philosopher, often called the French Hegel or the Catholic Hegel, that is Maurice Blondel, devoted an entire book to analyzing the, the dialectic of action. So going on with this, he says, um, these are the organs of performance and actualization which have within them the action qua action or the inner as such. And he says, but the externality which the inner obtains through them is the action as a reality separated from the individual. So there's a natural movement, a natural tendency, a natural desire to externalize oneself, not just one's intentions, but oneself in expressive action. Action which makes what it is that you are visible to the outside world. But in doing so, the action ceases to be solely expressive of you. Why? Because it is for another. It has gone out into a world that you don't control. How many times have we, we seen this sort of thing happen? So he goes on and he says, um, speech and work, right, examples are outer expressions in which the individual no longer keeps and possesses himself within himself, right? That would be to be closed off within oneself, keeping oneself within oneself. If you want to have your being visible for yourself to know what you are, Hegel thinks that we do, you have to externalize it. But in externalizing it, you cross over this threshold into the world of others who can decide what they want to make of your, your speech, your action, and generally don't interpret it in the way that you do, which leads to a lot of disappointment and frustration. And then, you know, there's, there can be a dialectic, well, I'm going to withdraw into myself, screw all the rest of them, they don't understand me. But then you want to express yourself, right? And so you do express yourself again, perhaps after more reflection, after, you know, making sure that they can't possibly misunderstand you. And sure enough, they misunderstand you and misappropriate your actions and perhaps even get them completely wrong. And this can go on and on and on. So he goes on and he says, uh, here we go. Speech and work are outer expressions. Uh, they let the inner get completely outside of him, leaving it to the mercy of something other than himself. Now think about that. Think about how many times, how many ways, and in how many different modes we do something or we say something and other people <clears throat> either misinterpret it or perhaps even perversely twist it around, or they turn it to their own advantage and make it into something else that we hadn't intended. Um, you know, classic example of this, if we want to think about um, you know, interesting plays in terms of romance, 
think about um, Cyrano de Bergerac, you know, and the famous uh, help that he's giving to his friend who's a bit of a, a lummox and tongue-tied and can't actually uh, help himself out with, with the girl that he ought to express his mind, his love for, right? Cyrano gives him the externalization, the words, and when Cyrano does so, those words cease to be his. And at first he's thinking, oh, this is great, uh, you know, I'm perfectly happy to do this for a friend, but then he falls in love with the girl, right? And he wants her to recognize that those words are not that big ox who's been saying them, but that pointy-nosed guy who happens to be one of the greatest swords people in France. And we could say that about action, too. Think about his, his action of fighting with, with a sword, right? Uh, that can be interpreted in all sorts of ways. That can, once you, you know, make a move, you've committed yourself. And we go on and on and on about all these sorts of things. That's what makes this so, so interesting, I think. So he goes on and he says, this is the reason we can say with equal truth that these expressions express the inner too much as that they do so too little. They don't express it to the right amount. They express it either too much or too little. So how do they express it too much? In creating a kind of vulnerability. We've all had that experience when we do something or we say something that truly does manifest who we are, or at least what we mean to manifest at that moment. And now we're exposed, we're naked, we're open, we're out in front of the world. You know, think about what goes on with YouTube all the time, right? People create videos, and then they see the comments rolling in. And some of the comments are just from trolls who say, oh, you, you suck, you're no good, you know? Um, and, and, you know, if, you, if, if you're not ready for that sort of thing, that can be very devastating. Some of the comments will be, well, I think you're wrong on this point, and, or, hey, this is so great, and then they take something that you said, that one thing, and they run with it and turn it into an entire paragraph, and you're like, well, that's not exactly what I meant. So Hegel goes on. He says, too little, right? Because in speech and action, the inner turns itself into something else, thus putting itself at the mercy of the element of change, which twists the spoken word and the accomplished act into meaning something else than they are in and for themselves as actions of this particular individual. Oh, you know, I um, punched that guy in the nose. Well, you're such a you know, brave person standing up against the bully. Well, I didn't mean to stand up against the bully. I just didn't like that guy. Your action has been transformed by people adding a narrative to it, by slipping it into a kind of schema. This happens in human relationships all the time. And it happens in particular when we have situations in which a lot of different, let's call them schemas or scripts are already in place. These are furnished to us by the culture. Part of what it means to become a mature individual is to learn how to move around within these scripts and not be simply held at their mercy. So in a way, the expression, the action of the speech expresses too little. It doesn't adequately express what the individual is trying to externalize out of their inner, out of their activity, out of their consciousness. What else? He says, um, too much, right? Because the inner itself breaks out in them and there remains no antithesis between them and it. They give not merely an expression of the inner, <clears throat> but directly the inner itself. This is when you're super vulnerable, right? You, somebody says, oh, you really did mean that thing that you said, didn't you? What a jackass. What a, what a naive person. Oh my goodness, you, you really meant that? Or you really intended to do that stupid action? That idiosyncratic action, that whatever it, it, it is. We make ourselves vulnerable to other people who are themselves, it gets even more complicated, doing the same thing in saying anything to us, except insofar as what they're saying is the most stereotyped and impersonal 
of, of things. <clears throat> so, too much and too little. So he says, um, not only do the results of the actions through this externality of the influence of others lose the character of being something constant in the face of other individualities. See, what we're trying to do is when we act in a meaningful way, when we say things in a meaningful way, we want them to stand as sort of a monument or a testament or an ongoing witness to what it is that we are expressing. But the world of others is a shifting world. You may say something to this other, and then you find that this other other over here interprets things completely differently. We've all had the experience of probably offending somebody and telling a joke that was originally supposed to um, you know, make us laugh, and then we find out that it's actually offensive to somebody else. Or we can say this about all sorts of other uh, expressions where we didn't mean to give offense to that other person, but then afterwards we can say, oh, yeah, I see how they could take it that way. They can take it that way because they're a different individuality, right? So he, he goes on and he says, in their relationship to the inner which they contain, they behave as a separated, indifferent externality. They can, qua inner through the individual himself, be something other than they appear to be. Once we let our words and our actions go out into the world, we're not in control of them anymore. We can try to spin them, right? We can try to manage them. This is why some people in their social media keep it super locked down. They don't want their words escaping out there into the ether. Um, that's why some people on their YouTube channels uh, block comments or uh, make sure that all the comments have to be regulated. They want to keep control over that. I'll admit that I myself do that on certain videos where I'm discussing very controversial topics. You notice that I'm not doing that here on the Hegel videos. But this is also sort of a risky thing as well. Hegel has externalized his uh, point of view into this, this uh, book, The Phenomenology. Perhaps I'm totally misinterpreting it. That would mean Hegel, in his expression of his in, inner mind, has gotten screwed over by, by me, the interpreter. Or perhaps my interpretation reaches you and you say, that guy's crazy. This isn't what Hegel's saying at all. You know, because I read on a website that what Hegel's really talking about is you know, thesis, synth antithesis, synthesis. Where, when is he going to get to that stuff, right? These are the risks that we take in existing in a world in which we don't just exist, but we do things and we say things. He goes on. He says, um, here we go. Uh, Either the individual intentionally makes them appear to be other than what they are in truth, one possibility, or he is too clumsy to give himself the outer aspect he really wanted and to, so establish, and to establish it so firmly his work cannot be misconstrued by others. These are things that we can say about people. The action, he says then, as a completed work, has the double and opposite meaning of being either the inner individuality and not its expression, the vulnerability, showing what's, what's inside, or qua external, a reality free from the inner, a reality which is something quite different from the inner. Here is where uh, the possibility of deception, of hypocrisy, of literally putting on a mask comes into play as well. By using stereotyped language, we can try to create an ethos. Aristotle actually talks about this in book three of his rhetoric. Uh, the art of rhetoric, the art of finding the means of persuasion, right? This is not something radically new on the scene. Descartes also talks about this quite a bit in The Passions of the Soul, the fact that the passions can be counterfeited on the, the face, which is supposed to be sort of the, the screen on which we see a person's passions. So he says, um, the action is a, is a double and opposite meaning. Uh, on account of this ambiguity, this, this uh, ability to be both ways, we must look around for the inner as it is still within the individual himself, but in 
a visible or external shape. Where are we going to find that? In what we call the organ here. In the organ, he says, however, it is present only as the immediate activity itself. The activity uh, goes into, uses, inhabits the organ, which attains its externalization in the deed, the action, the tun, you know, uh, which either does or, again, does not represent the inner. So we, we have this problematic. And, you know, we might be tempted to say, you know, you know where the real problem lies? Stupid organ getting in the way. If only we could have some way of going directly from the inner out into the world of action, everything would be crystal clear. And that's a dream. That's just a, uh, an imaginary uh, solution. It's not a real solution to this, this fundamental problem. So he says, the deed either does or does not represent the inner. The organ, re regarded in the light of this antithesis, does not, therefore, provide the expression which is sought. So what do we do? We are in an aporia. We are in a problematic that it doesn't seem that we can get out of. Perhaps we can try to specify the relationship between the activity and the organ, the inner and the outer, or perhaps we can uh, more uh, fully uh, specify the relation to that which is outside those are both ways of approaching this. Hegel is, is going to, as you were going to see, try a number of different ways to make sense out of this relation in the paragraphs to come. If now the outer shape could express the inner individuality only insofar as that shape is neither an organ nor an action, hence only insofar as it is a passive whole, it would behave as an existent thing which passively received the inner as an alien element into its passive existence and thereby became a sign of it, an external contingent expression whose actual aspect lacked any meaning of its own, a language whose sounds and sound combinations are not the real thing itself, but are linked with it by sheer caprice and are contingent in relation to it. After that long discussion in the last paragraph, we now have a short and, and rather succinct paragraph in 313. Uh, there's really one main idea running through this, or at least say one constellation of ideas. And we're back to thinking about the relationship between the inner and the outer and whether expression is really possible. So the, the inner or the individuality, which is consciousness and activity, is still attempting to express itself in, in the outer. So he says, if the outer shape, the gestalt, could re express the inner individuality only insofar as that shape uh, is not what we tried to make it in the last paragraph. So that is not an organ, not the action, which is an externalization, which makes it a being for another out there in the world. What is left to us? Well, what is the neuter of organ and action in this case? Hegel says that it is to be a thing. Um, he says... Uh, it, it, so far as it is a passive whole, it would behave as an existent thing which passively received the inner as, but as an alien element into its passive existence. So we're able to have some sort of, uh, not expression, but something going on here. Sort of like Descartes' metaphor for the body and the soul of the soul as being like the pilot in the ship. Right, steering it around. Um, it's really an alien element. It's, it's foreign to it. Descartes says it's a different substance, right? That's sort of what Hegel's talking about here. But Hegel goes a different way with this. Here he says, uh, therefore it became a sign. The thing is a sign of the inner, of the individuality. That doesn't sound that bad, right? We're used to thinking of signs in terms of uh, what we call in linguistics motivated signs, where there's some sort of connection between the sign and that of which it is a sign. But Hegel doesn't see it that way. 
if, if we're dealing with signs, we now venture into the realm of what he calls language, spracha, but a particular kind of language in which the relationship between the sign, the thing that's signifying, and the signified is, as he says, capricious or contingent. It's not something we can actually rely upon. So you know, for the purposes of expression, this is not going to be particularly helpful, right? When we express something in terms of signs, whether those signs be our words or our actions or something else, uh, some visual medium that we're working with, or perhaps even something just in terms of, of computer code, whatever it happens to be, right? Um, waves of water doing certain things. We want there to be some sort of connection and not a purely arbitrary one between the sign and what the sign is the sign of. So he says, this is a real problem. We get a language whose sounds and sound combinations are not the real thing itself, but are linked to it in these arbitrary or contingent ways. And so what is the implication? Well, the implication is, Insofar as the outer is going to be a passive thing, we're going to run into a problem. But that's exactly what's going to happen with these pseudosciences that we're ultimately going to look at. 